If I say the word goat, G-O-A-T, many of us will think of that four-legged animal that will eat just about anything. However, some of us will think about the acronym G-O-A-T, or greatest of all time. Merriam-Webster added GOAT into the dictionary in 2018 as an acronym and a noun. It's defined as the most accomplished or successful individual in the history of a particular sport or category of performance or activity. I imagine that some of us have an idea of who we might consider to be the GOAT of their sport, whether it's LeBron James in basketball, Simone Biles in gymnastics, Tom Brady in football, Serena Williams in tennis, we all have our opinions. One of the only people who has laid claim to all of that for themselves is Muhammad Ali, who said, among other things, I'm the greatest thing that ever lived. I'm the king of the world. I'm a bad man. I'm the prettiest thing that ever lived. And he also said, I figured that if I said it enough, I would convince the world that I really was the greatest. I figured that if I said it enough, I would convince the world that I really was the greatest. Such an interesting thought, that if we say something enough, we can make the world believe us. Hmm. Today, we're finishing up our series on Follow the Leader. Of course, who is the leader we're talking about? Yes, it's Jesus. In our scripture passage today, Jesus and the disciples had just traveled from Galilee to Capernaum. And along the way, Jesus had told them that the Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. Then Mark tells us that the disciples didn't understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him. We pick up now with today's reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 33 and 34. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. This is the good news according to the Gospel of Mark. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. They were arguing about who was the greatest. Now, Mark doesn't tell us that they were arguing about who among the disciples was the greatest, but we can guess from their silence that is what they were doing. In the very next chapter of Mark, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, go to Jesus and say to him, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. So we're going to go with the assumption that in this chapter of Mark as well, they were arguing about who among themselves was the greatest. So let's get this straight. As they're walking from Galilee to Capernaum, Jesus tells them that he's going to be betrayed, he's going to be killed, and three days later he would rise from the dead. They don't respond. They don't ask questions because they're afraid to ask. Instead, they just begin arguing among themselves about who's the greatest. Who will be Jesus' right hand when he comes into power? The disciples still don't really get it. They don't get who Jesus really is. And Mark's gospel continues to portray them as not understanding what kind of a Messiah Jesus was. They were still hung up expecting a king like King David who would set the world straight about Israel and who would wipe out anyone who challenged them. It's possible, I guess, that they've just heard Jesus tell them that he would be killed and they don't understand. So it caused some uncertainty for them. And a natural human response to uncertainty is fight or flight. Rather than running away, they decide to argue with each other. Aren't we just like the disciples? We don't like to have uncertainty surround us. We don't know what to do with it. And it can feel like a threat to our position, to our power, to our place in the world. Just like the disciples, we want to be in charge, to have authority and power. We want to have recognition for what we do, along with some honor and prestige to go along with it. We want to be in control, don't we? Almost all of us want to feel like things are under control, our control. This need for power and control and prestige affects us and it affects our children and our grandchildren because they learn from our example. It creates competition. Competition is deeply ingrained in society with people working harder and harder to be the greatest in their field, their area of expertise, their company, their department. Our children are urged to imitate this so they can gain admission to the college of their choice or the college of their parents' hopes and dreams so they can get a scholarship in their sport or for their intelligence. 
This competition, the stress of trying to be the greatest or the best, has an effect on our mental health as well. In a 2024 mental health poll taken by the American Psychiatric Association, results show that 43% of adults reported feeling more anxious than they did in 2023. The results in 2023 showed 37% were more anxious than the 32% in 2022. A recent health poll shows 32% of adolescents in the U.S. have an anxiety disorder, and anxiety has been diagnosed in children as young as eight. Our need for power, for control, for prestige is being seen and internalized by our children. Now, there are, of course, other factors at play in their anxiety, including social media, school shootings, other factors. In October, we'll address some of those with adults as well as children and youth. Our One Lamb initiative, along with the children and youth areas, are sponsoring speakers for you to learn from during the Sunday school hour. I hope you'll attend one or more of those sessions. Now, anxiety can trigger the fight or flight response, just as it did with the uncertainty of the disciples in our scripture passage, leading them to argue with one another. Now, we argue about everything these days. We argue about politics. We all argue about sports teams. We argue about how bad traffic is. You name it, we argue about it. We have developed, particularly in this country, polarized thinking, which is the mistaken notion that people are always either totally good and right, or they're totally bad and wrong. If they think like we think, they're right. If they don't, then they're wrong. When you say it out loud, that sounds absolutely ridiculous, doesn't it? How do we get here? What can we do to fix it? We need to think about what it means to each of us to be the greatest. Is it the world standards of greatness, which usually include power over someone else, wealth, control, status, influence? Or is it a component of faith where greatness is determined by service and sacrifice, humility, honor, truthfulness, faithfulness, vulnerability, all born out of love? What if we lived our lives as if we believed that greatness comes through the exercise of servanthood? serving others rather than having power over them. So let's do a quick exercise together. Think about the best person you have ever met. Not the greatest person, but the best person. Okay, you got that person in mind? Why did you pick them? And what qualities or characteristics make that person the best person you ever met? Let me tell you about the best person I've ever met, and I, I feel like I've met many really good people in my life. This person puts the concerns and the troubles of everyone else before their own. This person would do anything to help another. This person would serve in any possible way to make the world a better place. They would pray unceasingly, and this person is one of the most faithful people I have ever met. This person can identify someone in trouble and go to them offering help never bragging about it, and never seeking attention for it. I want to be just like that person. What about you? Are there things about your best person that you want to emulate? Can you and will you? There's no better time than today to begin to develop those qualities in yourself. I'm going to work on mine. And I, and I challenge each one of you to take one quality this week to work on to make yourself better. Simon Sinek has written many books on leadership, and he says that he wrote the book Leaders Eat Last after spending some time with the Marines in Afghanistan. He wondered what makes Marines so great, and he asked that of a very high-ranking officer, and the officer responded with, officers eat last. Simon, Sinek, Simon Sinek said, I took that as a gesture to mean that they will give the very essence of life, food, water, safety, life to another person, even if it means they eat less. Cynic ended with saying real leaders are those who will instinctively give themselves for others. And that's what our real leader did. Jesus gave himself for us out of the greatest love imaginable. How do, we how do we respond? How can we be 
real leaders who argue less and love more. I think starting with your best person's qualities is a great place to start. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.